Uh, good evening and welcome everyone to the February meeting, uh, community meeting of Central Park United Neighbors. Um, a little bit about our organization. Uh, Seaplan is the registered neighborhood organization uh, for the Central Park community in Denver and in Aurora. Uh, we are here to facilitate dialogue and create awareness around opportunities to engage on topics of importance to this community. We help people to find their way into a process so that resident questions, concerns, and ideas for a better community can be addressed in a uh, constructive and inclusive way. We promote uh, public service, civil civic discourse, and collective efficacy. At monthly meetings and through the work of our six working committees, CPIN facilitates the discussion of key issues with neighbors, engages in proactive problem avoidance, and amicable problem solving. CPUN is committed to providing an inclusive and welcoming environment for all members of our community, and we are from all volunteer board of your neighbors and registered 501c3. Uh, a quick review of our agenda this evening, we will begin with our outreach hour. Um, rather than doing a round table of uh, round robin sort of thing for our communities, uh, our um, secretary, Mark Mariner, is going to review some uh, results from our recent community survey. Then we'll get updates from our uh, community partners. Then we have a special guest with us, uh, Mike Reed, senior park ranger from Denver Parks and Rec. Um, and then we'll conclude with five minutes of public comment before moving on to our board meeting. Um, there we will have uh, committee reports. Uh, we'll have a brief follow-up on uh, some discussions from last, uh, last month. Uh, one topic was Park Creek Metropolitan District's uh, board and uh, what's going on with that, as well as a update from Aurora Police Department. Um, we'll then discuss uh, CPUN potentially taking over the responsibilities of CAB or the Citizens Advisory Board. We'll further discuss the survey and then we'll uh, conclude the board meeting with a treasurer's report and um, a follow-up discussion on the Unhoused Action Coalition, which uh, was uh, presented on last month by Travis Leiker, who is heading up that initiative. And then if there's time, we'll also speak a little bit about um, our open board seat outreach. Um, our board meeting is public. Anyone that's here and interested is welcome to attend. Next slide, please, Mark. Um, before we get started, I just want to acknowledge that a uh, beloved and respected member of our community and one of the original residents of this community, in fact, uh, Pat Teagarden, uh, passed away on February 5th after a brief illness. Uh, Pat was a dedicated public servant, most recently serving as a legislative liaison for the Colorado Department of Labor and Employment. He was the sitting mayor appointed uh, chairman of the SDC. He was about to begin a term as a board member for the Foundation for Sustainable Urban Communities. He was also a regular attendee of these meetings and always a friendly and supportive presence. Uh, news of his passing prompted an outpouring of messages of love from neighbors to the highest offices of Colorado politics. The State House and Senate paid tribute to Pat last week, with members of both parties repeating the refrain, be like Pat. That is to say, to be selfless, empathetic, and fair. Uh, those are values that this organization strives for, and we are grateful for the example that Pat set. And we send our sincere condolences to Pat's wife and children, as well as to his many friends and colleagues. With that, I will turn things over to Mark. Mark, take it away. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jeff. I've got a uh, about 10 questions, questions worth of slides to go through here. Um, this is just a selection of the questions that were in our survey. I've uh, kind of picked a few that I think will be helpful for the community to see, but also for some of our community partners. So if your question at the end is, did you ask about this and what did it look like? I'll have to say, we'll have to talk about that another time because we only got a limited amount of time to talk about these slides. So um, please don't ask that question if you can. Uh, but in the meantime, I'll go through these questions and uh, I'll try to, if somebody could monitor chat just in case any other questions come up. Um, so one of the first sections we asked about was essentially just what uh, rate asked residents to rate on a zero to 10 scale, different aspects of the community to gauge what they're happier with and what they're less happy with. Um, overall, as you can see here, parks and elementary schools were topped out. Um, and I generally in these in these ratings, um, for those don't, who don't uh, do a lot of survey research or work on this kind of stuff a lot, um, I do survey research for a living. So I consider on a zero to 10 scale, anything that's a seven or higher to be 
um, a good number. And my apologies for those who asked me to put in a, a, a correction or add it to this to highlight that, but I forgot. Um, but anyways, you know, something in the seven or higher is generally, generally good. Anything above five is certainly positive. Um, so we got a, a slightly above five on everything, um, or at least slightly above five on everything. But though obviously the crime rate and traffic in the community uh, top popped out here as the biggest concerns along with slightly uh, better ratings for the transportation options in the community. Um, and then we'll, we'll break down some of these other slides in between, but uh, the schools were generally well rated cleanliness uh, and parks in particular. Um, so this one uh, is, is a breakdown by sub neighborhood of the grocery option ratings in the neighborhood. Again, a zero to 10 scale. So it's the same stuff as before. Um, the overall rating, as you can see here, was 6.4 for the grocery options, but you can see there's a wide range. It went all the way down to a four in North End and 4.3 in Beeler Park, uh, whereas those uh, closest to lots of grocery options or closest to the new Sprouts um, generally rated it much higher, closer to, to uh, eight. So you can see that there's there's definitely an interest in the North End for, or the Northern end of our community, I should say, not just in the North end for some more grocery options up there. Um, and for those who are listening or watching later, we hear you and we will see what we can do about that. Um, the other option on, 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 excuse me, item where there was a sort of a wide variation was on restaurant option ratings by sub neighborhood. Um, again, those that are close to what I'll say, Stanley Marketplace, East Bridge Town Center gave much higher ratings. Uh, again, those on the north end of the neighborhood uh, gave a much lower ratings. Um, we'll certainly monitor this to see how the new developments in the north end, there's a lot of, of retail going in um, north of I-70 in the near future and the next year or two. So we'll monitor these and see how it goes and see what we can do about um, you know, attracting other businesses and whatnot to the other area. I mean, basically every neighborhood north of I-70, you know, the highest we got was a 5.0 for Conservatory Green, and they're right across the street from, from a mall, so you would hope that it would be higher. But uh, we'll see what we can do, and we hear you. Um, on the other issue of transportation options, this one I thought was interesting as well because of the uh, differences we can see by those that are close to the train station. We got, you know, higher ratings, 6.7, uh, 6.6. .6. Those, again, that are in the far north end, Unfortunately, I'm not, uh, you know, have have much more limited options. I'm not even sure where exactly bus services are, are in that area, but it's, I know it's pretty limited. So um, I thought that might be interesting to the uh, folks at NETC. So hopefully they're uh, on the uh, call right now or on the Zoom meeting right now and see that. Um, I'm sure they recognize that. And, you know, we all know that RTD has some, some struggles and uh, just thought that would be a, an important thing for that area of the community to, again, be heard on. Um, the traffic ratings were a little bit different in terms of uh, Wicker Park is still, you know, has one of the lowest ratings for traffic, but Central Park North right there by the bridge uh, also had the second high, second lowest rating uh, of traffic, whereas the, the Bluff Lake part that uh, we just uh, essentially added to the community, to our, our zone, uh, had the, the, the best ratings of traffic. Um, nothing was particularly great, but uh, anytime I see something that's, you know, a little bit of concern, I want to see I look in to see where is it more of a concern than other areas. The good news for the folks in the north end is they didn't, they were uh, had, had among the best traffic. I shouldn't say that they didn't have any complaints because the rating is still relatively low, but uh, it's definitely not among the worst. So, um, so of also of interest, I think, to one of our community partners at NETC, we had a question about commuting by Central Park residents. Um, interestingly, obviously, a very high percentage of, of the community here is usually working from home, 36%. Um, another 15% say that they are retired and do not commute for work. And then I think there's another 4% uh, that don't work outside the home. So more than half the community from our survey was saying that they actually don't commute. Um, so I think that's the work from home part has always been relatively high in this area. And I think it's really grown with the pandemic. Um, the two main areas that really jumped is where people are commuting to is Anschutz and in particular downtown. So. Um, you know, hopefully that helps a little bit with that. And we also had a question on if you commute, which forms of transportation do you take? Uh, half said they drive themselves. Uh, we weren't sure why 25% said uh, NA. I think that's probably people who um, don't commute or don't commute much. But there was decent uptake of uh, taking the bike or train, not nearly as much for bus walking or carpooling. Um, obviously, if the main places you're going are downtown, it's a little harder to do that, but there's definitely some good options for uh, these for taking the train downtown or taking bikes to uh, Fitzsimmons if you're um, able to do so. So hopefully that's, or I'm sorry, Anschutz, um, if you're able to do so. 
the other thing I wanted to break down on was the, the crime rating in the area to see how much of a difference there was there. Uh, there wasn't as much of a gap from the top area to the bottom. Um, there on North End and Conservatory Green, Green and Beeler Park, instead of being at the bottom of the ratings, are actually at the top. Now, those aren't super high ratings, but they're definitely the, you know, the best of the, the bunch, where the Central Park uh, North and Bluff Lake and Denver and Eastbridge areas that kind of go along the creek there seem to have the biggest concern. So we'll hopefully have some questions in the future that we can drill down on there, but I thought these ratings would be interesting to the police department. I wanted to make sure that the uh, folks in the police department had seen the areas with the greatest concern. That may also be somewhat tied to um, some of the street racing that's been going on, uh, I believe, in near those areas as well. Um, some other related questions about whether or not people feel safe. Uh, the good news is that the, in all the categories we looked at here, the vast majority of residents said that they did feel safe. Uh, the lowest was actually those who were in Aurora, with only 65% saying that they feel safe in the Central Park community. Um, we also, in addition to neighborhoods, these are all sorted by the percent uh, who said no uh, versus the percent that said yes. Um, and is what, in addition to sub-neighborhood groups, we also have some other subcategories like by racial groups here or by LGBT category uh, if we had enough responses in that in that group. Um, so a lot of them are kind of in the middle of here. We're about 80 something percent say that they're um, uh, say that they feel safe, but we definitely have some areas where there's more pockets of concern than others. Some of those are again similar to uh, the areas where they rated crime poorly, but uh, it's not a perfect match there. So um, and then the, I think this is the last slide that I've got for just general uh, consumption, but one of them was a one to ten scale of uh, ratings of the Denver Police Department. Um, generally, again, a seven is a positive rating. So overall, we got a positive rating. There was a little bit of a difference between some of the top groups and the bottom. Um, and it appears that uh, in Bluff Lake, there, in Aurora, there was a little bit more concern. Uh, among our Black and African American residents, there was definitely you know a lower rating there in Wigger Park as well. Um, so again, I thought that would be helpful information for the Police Department to uh, see. I obviously can't you know, drill down. I don't have any extra questions here on exactly why that is for some of these groups versus others. So it's definitely something that I hopefully will uh, engage in a dialogue with them about uh, how we can bring some of these ratings up, you know, about all across the board, but also especially there because uh, we definitely want the police department to be well received here. And that's what I've got. Thanks a lot, Mark. Um, this was our first community survey in nearly uh, three years and we had over 1300 responses. So uh, we were really happy with that. Um, I want to mention that this was just one of two surveys that we conducted last year. Um, the other one was dedicated to issues uh, of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, uh, at a future um, CPAN board meeting, we will provide a similar uh, breakdown of the results of, of, those, of that particular survey as soon as um, it's ready. As Mark said, these um, surveys are really helpful to us and to other local stakeholders to better understand the needs of the community. And in the board portion of the uh, meeting, you'll hear us talk a little bit about how best to communicate um, the results that we have here to those stakeholders and to the uh, residents of Central Park. With that, we will move on to um, community partner updates, actually. Uh, if we could just back up one slide there, Mark. Um, uh, Lieutenant Hines, why don't you get us started? Yeah, good evening, everyone. Can you, well, I'm trying to get video to come online. There yeah. we go. <laughs> Sorry, I'm on a different computer than I normally use. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Kevin Hines. I'm the Sector 1 Lieutenant for District 5 uh, with the Denver Police Department. Our area covers uh, essentially everything west of Peoria Street, so it includes all of the Central Park neighborhood area around Northfield Mall, uh, things of that nature. So um, I'm also joined tonight by Officer Friends, who's our uh, community resource officer for Sector 1. So just to give you guys an update on some of the issues that are uh, troubling us at the moment, I would say that vehicle-related crimes is one of our biggest concerns right now. Uh, motor vehicle theft uh, in Precinct 511, that's the, uh, basically think the area north of I-70, is up 20.6% for the last 28-day period and is up 206% year-to-date. Uh, similarly, we're seeing a rise in theft for motor vehicles. Um, we are down a little bit in motor vehicle thefts in Precinct 512, which is the area south of I-70. 
um, but we still remain up 185% year to date. And we're also seeing that uh, year to date stats on uh, theft from motor vehicles is also up 82.1%. So we've been engaging in a lot of uh, efforts there to try to head off some of these crimes, identify the people responsible um, and uh, prevent these crimes in the neighborhood. Um, we've been working with the Colorado Metro Auto Theft Task Force on some uh, big cases that are going to be coming down soon with some uh, organized crime nexus. We should be getting some uh, coca cases going soon. That's the uh, Colorado version of a RICO case. Um, and uh, we're also uh, deploying some other assets out in the neighborhood. We have a, a couple of bait cars that are owned by uh, Colorado Metro Auto Theft Task Force that are uh, deployed out in the neighborhood right now. And these are basically uh, cars that are set up to be, uh, um, usually we pick vehicles that are similar to the ones that are being stolen a lot and uh, park them out in the neighborhood and see if they get stolen. And if they do, we have cameras and GPS and everything on board so we can uh, track down the folks that are driving those and, uh, you know, identify who's stealing the vehicles in the area. But um, over the last 28 day period in, in my sector, we've had 79 stolen vehicles. Uh, 41 of those were in precinct 511 and 38 of those were in precinct 512. Um, just some preventative efforts uh, I can mention on those. You know, if you have a garage, use it for your vehicles. If you, uh, if you are parking outside, try to park in a well-lit area. If you have a frequently stolen vehicle, consider getting um, an auxiliary lock, like a steering wheel lock, uh, similar to a club or something of that nature that really um, prevents these thefts. I've yet to see a vehicle stolen that had a club on it. Uh, to give you an idea of some of the vehicles we're seeing stolen most frequently, um, in Precinct 511, uh, the leading vehicles are Chevys, uh, followed by Hyundais and Kias. And Precinct 512, we're seeing Kias, uh, Fords, Chevys, GMCs, and Hyundais making up 75% uh, of the auto thefts there. And obviously, that's you know a number of the big manufacturers there. So just something to keep in mind, it's a problem we're working on. We have a lot of resources we're putting towards it because we know it's a problem. Uh, you may have seen some of the recent news coverage, but Colorado on the whole is said to be the uh, worst state in the country for auto theft right now. So this isn't a problem isolated just to our sector or our district or even our city. Um, but something we're dealing with across the entire region right now. So we're trying to do some things to get that under control. And uh, I hope that none of you get victimized uh, in an auto theft. But if you do, just uh, know we are trying to track those vehicles down and uh, stop these kind of crimes. One of the other things I was asked about for this meeting, um, and Carol, I think I saw you on the call. I know this was a, a question you were asked to bring up was the issue of speeding in District 5 and particularly in the Central Park neighborhoods. Um, I pulled some of our stats for you just to kind of give you an idea of what's going on. Um, as you guys have probably heard, Derek Pollard uh, serves as our traffic officer in District 5 and he's assigned specifically to uh, traffic related problems, deals with some of our accidents, some of our DUIs and a lot of our speeding complaints. Uh, currently, he has uh, eight areas on his focus list for Precinct 511, an additional 13 areas in Precinct 512. Uh, if you guys are seeing areas where you're uh, concerned about a lot of uh, speeding taking place, uh, please feel free to call in and talk to Danae or Derek, and we can get that location on the list and uh, try to give it some extra patrol. One of the things we try to do when we can't be out there is use, uh, utilize some of the resources we have like our speed trailer or our uh, semi-permanently installed uh, speed signs. Those are the ones that uh, mount to traffic poles and uh, tell you your speed as you're going by. Um, something a lot of people don't realize is that the ones that we put up on the traffic poles actually have a data logging capability for us. So we can go back after a sign's been up for a couple of weeks and analyze every car that's been uh, that's past that point. It'll tell us the average speeds, the highest speeds, the lowest speeds, the 
volume of cars. So it gives us some data to know where to uh, put our enforcement efforts uh, out there in the district. Um, we also have the photo radar vans that we use through our photo enforcement unit. Uh, you'll sometimes see those along uh, certain corridor roads. Uh, they have a lot of rules about where those can be deployed, but they are a deterrent to speeding within the neighborhoods. Uh, to give you an idea on where we're stacking up in accidents, and these are some district-wide statistics just because we don't have them broken down by uh, sector necessarily. For the entire year of uh, 2021, we had 2,079 non-injury accidents within the district. Uh, all of the top locations were on the highways. Obviously, we have quite a bit of highway that passes through the district, so I-70 led the way for uh, accidents. We had 333 of those accidents were uh, catted as injury accidents in 2021. Um, uh, just because they get listed as an injury accident doesn't always mean that they turned out to be injury accidents. That's just how the call came in initially. Uh, during 2021, we ran 650 radar setups within the district where we had an officer uh, set up to uh, run speed enforcement. And uh, we responded to 280, I'm sorry, 282 reports of reckless drivers. Uh, our officers conducted over 10,900 vehicle stops in the district during 2021, which comes out to about 30 stops per day. Um, and uh, to give you a little bit of a breakdown, uh, so to look at where we're going so far this year, Precinct 511 has had 49 accidents so far this year. None of those have been serious bodily injury, fatalities, or pedestrian involved. For Precinct 512, we've had 74 accidents so far this year. Two of those involved serious bodily injury and we had no fatalities or pedestrian related accidents. Um, I believe that both of the serious bodily injury accidents were on the freeway, although uh, I'm not positive on one of those right offhand. So um, that's just kind of some of what we're doing on the uh, speeding issue. Uh, Danae, is there anything that you wanted to add in there before I take any questions on these issues? Good evening. Um, not on the traffic related um, issue. I don't know why my camera's not working, but you guys can all hear me, right? Yeah, we hear you. We can see you too. And we see you too. Oh, so, well, I can't see me. If you wanted to get your other updates too, that'd be great. And then we can go to yes. Questions. Awesome. So yes, um, we recently have acquired um, some etching kits at our District 5 station that I wanted to notify everybody about. Um, many of you know, this past summer, we partnered with Lincoln Tech and hosted a few etching events with them. Um, Lincoln Tech is like an automotive school, so they had all the tools and equipment to be able to uh, basically etch hundreds and hundreds of cars. What we did was etch the last eight of the VIN onto the catalytic converters and then did a neon strip of uh, heat resistant paint on those. Um, and again, it's not a preventative thing, but it was a huge deterrent, um, long story short. Um, prior to this idea, um, we would catch, you know, make a traffic stop and somebody would have like eight catalytic converters in their car. The problem was there's no identifying serial numbers on the converter, on the converters that, um, you know, helped us link it back to the original um, victim or the vehicle or even that report. So it was nearly impossible for us to prosecute um, some of these people for that. So this has been a huge help. And actually, I think we just had word that um, it may have actually helped prevent um, a catalytic converter being stolen this past week or last week. But um, long story short, we do have a uh, a few kits available to loan out to anybody in the district, anybody um, who owns a business or even residents. If you guys are interested, it's a do it yourself. Just contact me and I'd be happy to get one of those kits out to you. Um, what it includes is an etching tool and then the can of the heat resistant paint. And then we also have some instructions in there. Um, yeah, we'd be happy to get it out to you guys if you guys are interested. So just reach out to me. Yeah, and if I could add on that, Danae, this is kind of an ongoing effort we're having to try to uh, serialize as many catalytic converters as we can. Um, in the time since we started this program, I believe we've only had one catalytic converter that was marked stolen. Um, 
And so there, there may be some preventative uh, effect um, when a criminal gets under there and sees that these are marked because we did try to do a big public information campaign around the time that we started that program. And as Danae mentioned, we had an incident just this uh, past week where somebody who followed the same MO as somebody who had uh, previously stolen a catalytic converter from a business uh, showed up at the business and uh, opted not to steal the catalytic converter that was marked. So uh, we're hoping that the more we get this out there, the more we deter this crime and the more uh, easily, the, the, the better we can do at uh, actually catching people if they have uh, stolen a catalytic converter. And Danae, did you have anything else before we take any questions? Uh, no, I just put my email in the chat. So anybody who um, has any questions on that or is interested in that, just shoot me an email and I'd be happy to talk to you about it. All right. Any qu uh, questions for officers, Heinz and friends? I've got a couple questions. Um, Officer Heinz, what is being done in terms of investigations for stolen vehicles? Um, the reason I'm asking is because uh, I had a vehicle stolen, a work van stolen um, a while back, and it was actually stolen uh, on the Aurora side of Central Park, uh, but they brought the vehicle over into the Denver side, so I was dealing with both um, agencies, and I was told that they're real, they, the rate of theft was so high and that there was basically a shortage um, on police enforcement that they that they really didn't uh, do anything on the investigative side and I'm wondering is is that the case now and if so or if not if you can kind of talk a little bit about that also you had mentioned Colorado's version of RICO and I just wanted to get a little bit better understanding of what you meant about that because I know that there's like a drug term related to that um, sentencing. Um, and then lastly, the radar, um, police radar, do you guys have to have a, do you, do you need to meet a specific quota um, for ticketing? Okay, um, let me go through those questions here. And if I miss one of them, please remind me and I'll go back to it. Uh, so on the issue of stolen vehicles, we always investigate those as best we can. Um, a lot of times we don't have a lot of forensic evidence available when a vehicle is stolen and oftentimes not when it's recovered either. Um, typically what happens is the uh, reporting jurisdiction where the vehicle was stolen will put, in, in, put the initial report in and they'll also uh, enter the vehicle into NCIC and CCIC, which is the uh, crime databases that uh, officers have throughout the state and the country so that if an officer runs a license plate or VIN number on that vehicle, they know that it's stolen. Um, when a vehicle's later recovered, it uh, the, the recovering agency typically handles a report at that point. So it is kind of a cooperative effort between agencies as you, as you noticed. I'm assuming in your instance, a vehicle was recovered uh, unoccupied rather than somebody being in the vehicle. Is that correct? Yeah, actually it's set for quite a period of time in front of somebody's house. And so it was a work vehicle. They contacted us and let us know that the van had been parked out there. And of course the catalytic converter had been taken as well on that. Yeah, oh, sorry to hear that. Um, yeah, so and in those cases, a lot of times we don't have a lot of evidence to go on. Um, it's hard to uh, get prints from a vehicle in a lot of cases. And if it's not involved in a more serious crime, a lot of times it isn't printed um, on, the, uh, on the recovery side. That's not always the case. It kind of depends on the circumstances and whether the recovering officer sees an obvious print. Sometimes, sometimes a suspect gets in and adjusts a rear view mirror and leaves a nice thumbprint right on the rear view mirror. So they usually look for those and things like that that might be printable. Outside door handles aren't very useful for that. Steering wheels usually aren't very useful. So um, before they go to the effort of, you know, covering your whole car in this bright orange uh, dust that's impossible to get off, we uh, usually won't collect prints unless it seems like it's a pretty good likelihood that we're going to recover some on the vehicle. Um, 
when a vehicle is stolen, as I said, it does get put in our hot sheet and into NCIC and CCIC so our officers um, can hopefully recover it. Our best best outcomes usually come when we catch suspects in the vehicle because then we can actually tie them to the crime and prosecute those. Um, your second question, I believe, was uh, involving the, uh, the RICO type cases. And I used RICO just because that's a... Uh, something well known most people have heard of. Um, in this instance, we're actually talking about COCA, which is a Colorado Organized Crime Control Act. It's basically um, a set of state laws we have that allow us to deal with organized crime. And in some of these cases, we are seeing organized crime syndicates that are uh, involved in the theft of these vehicles where um, a group of individuals are stealing uh, an awful lot of vehicles and taking them to chop shops, running them out of state, things of that nature. So uh, given that this is uh, that one of the cases coming up is going to be going to a grand jury pretty soon, I can't give a lot of details on it, um, but there are a couple of groups that have been identified that are uh, that are causing an awful lot of our problems with uh, with stolen vehicles. And when we can link it to an organized crime nexus, it gives us uh, uh, more ability to prosecute it in different ways and uh, and more severe um, criminal penalties for that kind of stuff. And just because the criminal justice system recognizes that there's a difference between um, an 18 year old that goes out and steals a car on a joyride and somebody who's uh, essentially made a criminal enterprise out of stealing vehicles and chopping them, things of that nature. And then, I'm sorry, can you remind me one more time on your third question? The last one was about the, whether or not there was a quota that needed to be met for traffic tickets. Oh, thank you. Uh, no, we don't have quotas. Quotas are generally considered unlawful. We don't want to, just like we don't have commissions for tickets we write, we don't have quotas for them directly. Now, certainly, um, there's an expectation that officers who are assigned to the traffic unit are going to be writing uh, a lot more traffic related tickets than officers assigned to the gang units. So we do look at officer performance and say, hey, if you're in a traffic enforcement role, you're expected to be out there enforcing traffic and you're in the bottom 10% of officers citywide, we might have to look at your performance and figure out why you're not um, not uh, conducting as much enforcement as your peers are. But no, we don't run a quota system, uh, generally speaking, and especially not for the patrol officers who have a variety of duties. So um, we do have, again, officers who are specifically assigned to traffic, and they deal with those issues uh, far more frequently than your average patrol officer. For example, a, a traffic highway enforcement officer might write 25 or 30 tickets a day where um, you know, a, an officer working a precinct car that includes a highway might write that many per month. Mm -hmm. I, I hope that kind of answers the question. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. No problem at all. Thank you for, uh, thank you for your participation. Um, yeah, I want to be a little bit sensitive to time here because we do have some other community partners to get through as well as our uh, special guests. If um, uh, Lieutenant Hines, you wouldn't mind putting your contact information in the uh, in the chat there, people can follow up with you uh, directly, and perhaps if there's time, we can we can circle back at the end. Um, I hope that's okay. Yeah, I'm uh, putting my contact information into the chat right now, and uh, we'll be able to hang out for a few more minutes. I do have another meeting tonight, so I'll be kind of uh, listening sure. in here. But uh, you know, feel free to put something in the chat, and we'll check up back on it as well. So, um, and. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for your time, and uh, sorry to dominate too much of the talk. No, again. no, I, uh, I'm glad that you're here tonight, Lieutenant Hines. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Amanda Schultz from Councilman Herndon's office, are you here? I, I am. Thanks for having Hi. me. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'll keep it brief. Just two things that I really want to highlight and I'll stick around for questions as well. So you can feel free to ask me later or send them in the chat or email me. Um, one is Northeast Denver Leadership Week. We are so excited we're going to be able to do that. Hopefully, fingers crossed, knock on all of the wood um, in person again this year. 
So that's a free leadership development and career exploration program for high school students. If you know a high school student, please send them our way. It's a week long, um, it's incredible, and they'll meet a ton of amazing um, local and regional folks. So northeastdenverleadershipweek.org, or you can always reach out to our office and it's totally free to participate. The second thing I hope you've already heard a lot about, but I will continue to say it, is redistricting. Um, so council is going through the process of redistricting all of the council boundaries. So there are some map proposals out there. There are public meetings happening. Um, the next closest upcoming one is the 23rd over at Manual. And as of now, it's supposed to be in person. So if you're interested in participating in that process, you can get some background online on the city's website. You can go give your feedback, ask questions, learn more about that process um, at that meeting as well. So like I said, I will stick around and feel free to chat me, call, email, um, anything else you need. I'm here. Thanks, Amanda. Any uh, immediate questions? If not, we'll move on to Eric from Northeast Transportation Connections. Yeah, hey everyone. Hey, uh, Eric. Thanks for having us. Uh, but yeah, Eric Herbst with the Northeast Transportation Connection. Uh, again, we are the transportation nonprofit that works to reduce congestion and improve air quality. Uh, we do that by educating people about their mobility options in the neighborhood. Uh, quick thank you for the transportation questions in the survey. Those were very insightful and helpful. And we took a bunch of, a bunch of notes on those responses. Um, so again, thanks for that. Uh, I'll be real quick. Winter back to work day was last Friday. Uh, it was a great morning. We had a station at the Stanley Marketplace. Um, it was the perfect weather for a, win or a bike to work. Uh, I think bike from work was a little colder, um, but I think it was the first time we haven't had below freezing temperatures in the morning for winter bike to work day. So it was really nice to be out at the Stanley Marketplace. Uh, so thanks for everyone um, who may have kind of gone out and biked on that Friday. Um, so now we're starting to plan for summer bike to work day. Uh, we'll keep you guys updated as that progresses. That'll be in June. Um, we're in communication with the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure on the Central Park Boulevard bike lane. Um, you may have seen the striping that's happening now. Um, the vertical elements, so the posts and the curbs, should be going in later this month. Um, hopefully, depending on the weather, everything goes smoothly, and then they should be done hopefully by mid-March, if not by the end of March. Um, so we're excited about that. Um, and kind of in conjunction with that, we've been working with RTD on some on-demand bike lockers uh, coming soon to the Central Park train station. So the bike lockers that are there today you use a key and kind of one person gets access uh, for basically like six months that you kind of rent that bike locker. The new ones will be on demand and you'll use your phone to unlock it. So it'll just be able to serve more people, accommodate more uh, people biking to the station by being able to just unlock any available bike locker with your phone, lock it up and then get your bike when you're finished with it for the day and then it'll be free for anybody else to use it. Um, so those are coming to the Central Park Station and the Peoria Station, so we're super excited about those. Um, hopefully we'll have more updates on that later this spring and summer. Uh, really hope those get in before the summer bike to work day. Um, and as always, we have our monthly commuter challenge. Uh, you track eight trips to be entered to win prizes. This month, it's the prizes, the wingspan game. I don't know if anybody's played it, but it's a really fun board game and it has really good illustrations with uh, birds. So if you're into birds, it's a really fun game. Um, and I'll put the link to that challenge in the chat as well as my contact. Um, but that's all for me. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Those bike lockers sound great. It's a nice stuff, great. Uh, any questions for Eric? Uh, we will move on to Sam Gary Branch Library. John, I saw John. Hey, John. Hi, everyone. Um, I, yeah, just a couple quick things. Uh, my, my name is John Flanagan. I work at the Sam Gary Branch of the Denver Public Library here in Central Park. Um, 
Just a couple things about Sam Gary and then a couple things uh, system wide. Um, we are excited to be offering in person programming again starting March 1st. So um, we will be starting uh, picking back up three story times a week, um, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Uh, we also do now have um, drop in tech help on Tuesday mornings from 10 to 11. Um, of course, we help people with tech questions uh, anytime we're open, but this is a um, designated time for people to bring in uh, devices particularly. So if somebody is trying to figure out how to do something on their phone or a tablet, um, particularly after the holidays, um, a lot of times people get new devices and want to figure out how to read eBooks and do things like that, um, or if they're having trouble with their laptop. So that's uh, Tuesdays um, from 10 to 11, uh, no appointment necessary. And then um, we also um, are excited to be part of um, the, uh, we, the a grant, the Healthy Food for Denver's Kids, which is um, uh, the grant is put out by the Denver Department of Public Health and Environment. So we are each Wednesday, we are getting, um, we're upping it. We started out getting five bags of uh, produce and um, food for, um, for families with children. That's, that's kind of the only, um, uh, basically households with youth 18 and under. I'll, I'll put something in the chat here, um, but we can always up it if we get a higher demand. So um, people, families that are looking for um, uh, some, some free good food, it's, uh, it's a great program. So um, we're excited about that. Um, and then uh, system-wide, um, the <clears throat> most recent uh, library opened today, actually, uh, kind of a soft opening, the Art Park Branch Library. So that's in Rhino. Um, it's, uh, I get confused whenever I'm in Rhino, but <laughs> it's, it's like 35th and Chestnut kind of area. It's not far from uh, like the source, um, if anyone, people know where that is, um, but it's a mixed uh, use space where some artists will have kind of res residency within the building and then there'll be a small uh, library branch. So it opened today, um, apparently things went well. Um, so if you're, um, if you'd like to check out uh, different uh, Denver Public Libraries, um, uh, they are uh, open for business now. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, and then the only other thing I was gonna mention and I'll, I'll put something in the chat about this is that there are actually quite a few uh, jobs uh, that are posted right now. Oh, yeah, Jeff. Oh no, sorry, carrying. Okay. Um, at the uh, so we've got about twenty-two. I think twenty-two positions posted for Denver Public Library. Um, now that I think we're going to probably start uh, expanding hours, so they're they're kind of ramping up on hiring. Um, so there are all sorts of different uh, jobs posted uh, system wide. So I'll put a link to that in the chat as well. So if you know anyone who would like to work for the library, there are a lot of different exciting opportunities. And I, that's, I think that's all I got, unless anyone has any questions. Thanks, John. We did have a comment in the uh, chat requesting the information about the food program that we might be able to share out. Uh, yep. well, so I'm, I will post that in the chat right now. Great. Um, yeah. Great. Thanks. Thanks, John. Thank you. Um, Sarah from Mercy Housing, you're next. Hello. So I got the link to work. I missed the, I missed the meeting last month because um, my, my link wasn't working properly. So I'm sorry about that. But no major updates from Mercy or from Bluff Lake, the apartment, um, other than just a huge thank you to people who continue to support um, and send us stuff on the Amazon wish list. It's always so exciting to get packages. It's kind of like Christmas for me. Um, but I know the residents really love it when the food bank is, is nicely stocked with um, the cleaning supplies and the, um, the shampoo and the soap and the lotion and the feminine hygiene stuff. Um, I know it really helps them out. So a huge thank you to everyone who does that. Um, when the packages have like a, a name, um, we are, I send it to corporate and I know they send out thank you notes, but we've gotten a fair few recently. Um, that don't have names, they're just coming completely anonymously. So if any of those anonymous senders are, are on the call tonight, thank you so much. Um, let's see. Yeah, I don't, I don't really have any major stuff going on for us. It turns out though, so Jeff, turns out I know your wife. Um, and it turns out one of the other people on the call, he and I used to work together a couple of years back. So got to show him my dog. Ah. <laughs> so there's my dog. So he can see, he hasn't seen my dog in seven years. So. <laughs> Sorry, um, that was just quite a, an exciting connection. But um, 
but no, things are going, going really well over at Bluff. And again, you guys support is always wonderful. And thank you so much for all of it. Yeah. Small world. Thanks. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Um, and then we'll conclude things with the MCA. Uh, Jack, do you want to uh, speak to that? Sure, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, our executive board will meet in its quarterly meeting uh, tomorrow at noon. Uh, if you're available at noon, we hope you can join us. It will be a Zoom webinar. Uh, we have posted notice for a proposed policy adoption that will be discussed in the meeting there. That information can be found on our website. We're also ramping up for our busy summer season event schedules and other pools and parks related information will be forthcoming in the next couple of weeks. Any questions for Jack about that? For those of you that don't know, Jack is in addition to working for the MCA, a CPUN board member, and uh, he was gracious enough to invite our uh, guest speaker for the evening. So I'm going to let Jack handle those introductions as well. Take it away, Jack. Thanks, Jeff. So uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Mike Reed. He is uh, our senior park ranger for the Northeast District of uh, the Denver Department of Parks and Recreations. He is with us this evening. Uh, Mike has been with Parks and Rec for a couple of years now and was the 2021 Ranger of the Year for Denver Parks and Rec. So we are uh, very grateful that he can join us and I will give the floor to Mike. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the uh, introduction, Jack. Um, yeah, like Jack said, I'm the senior ranger for the Northeast District. Uh, we do have 84 parks in the district now. Um, I've been up in the Northeast for about two years now. Um, prior to that, I worked for Denver Parks. I taught tennis for 13 years, things like that. But um, as far as uh, what the park rangers do, um, you know, a lot of the First, uh, we do a lot of first responders um, to homeless encampments, dog off leash contacts. Um, those are going to be like the main two that we deal with. Um, we tend to connect other agencies uh, to help provide resources to these individuals, um, such as Colorado Coalition of the Homeless. I work closely with uh, Sina, who works for Colorado Coalition. Um, we've gotten a few individuals housed this year, which has been great. Um, I know within the last couple of years due to COVID and everything else, we've had stats for homelessness increase. Uh, 2020, I believe, was an increase of 80%. Uh, and I believe the preliminary stats for 2021 was a 50% increase on top of that. So we have had a lot of uh, changes and a lot of urban campers in the area uh, that tend to leave a lot of material behind. Um, and I know that's something that we're working on uh, curbing um, with other agencies. I've worked closely with Officer Fair, who works for District 5. Um, and then we're working with CDOT and Dottie, as well as Wastewater. Uh, Kevin Lewis, I've been in contact with uh, for Westerly Creek. Uh, we've had a lot of urban campers tend to use the wastewater tunnels throughout there. Um, and through contact with uh, Kevin, we've uh, been able to get a couple um, permanent mounts on the wastewater tunnels to prevent access, um, to try to prevent any material from building up in that area. Um, along Sand Creek, I'm seeing a lot of problems in that area as well. Um, you know, between camps being set up, uh, we have had a makeshift, I guess, bike park that has been there in the past, uh, creating ramps and things like that. In delicate areas, um, the kill deer, especially during the summertime, the birds that tend to nest in the grasses, you know, building the bike ramps and things like that, they have to find other areas to nest. So that's why it's important to make sure that we, uh, we don't try to just build into the parks. Um, I've had a lot of complaints for neighbors around the Greenway, Westerly Creek to Central Park neighborhoods. Um, mentioned that we've had a lot of golf course, um, golf carts driving into the parks. Uh, golf carts have driven a few teenagers underneath the 26th and Beeler Bridge to where there's graffiti almost weekly. Um, the maintenance team is trying to keep that under wraps and cleaned up frequently. Um, but again, if you guys live out in that area, uh, calling in service calls whenever you see that, letting us know when this is happening, uh, that can always help um, enforce and make sure that we can try to curb that behavior. Um, you know, we've had a, I think the biggest cleanup that we actually had to deal with was uh, working with CDOT and Dottie in the Sand Creek area where we had about 30 encampments just to the north side of I-70. Um, CDOT was able to come out. It was the difficult terrain kind of uh, area to clean up. 
um, but CDOT was able to clean up 29 tons of material. Um, Rangers have the, the trucks that we drive and uh, we've been able to clean up three and a half tons since they've cleaned that area up, um, not including the other encampments that we do uh, here and there. But as far as that big cleanup goes, we're trying to work on getting that um, scheduled again for another cleanup as I know there's other encampments there. Uh, to the with that being the north side of I-70, it runs into uh, property jurisdiction areas to where we, as park rangers, do not have the authority right now to enforce our Chapter 39 rules as far as the camping goes. But we're working with CDOT to see if we can change that uh, to where we can stay on top of this area more, so we don't have more encampments built up with all that material being left behind. Um, beyond that, uh, we have. Dog off leash calls, I mean, you know, frequented in Greenway Park. Uh, dog parks have been, Greenway Dog Park has been called recently for service calls with children being allowed in there. Um, so if you guys see any of that too, uh, we've caught in a couple family members that have brought children, toddlers using it as kind of a sandbox. Um, children playing in the, the gravel and whatnot in there too, which is not a sanitary thing. So we need to make sure if we can come together as a community um, and make sure that this doesn't happen in the future. That'd be great. Whether or not you guys just call the park rangers, we can come out and address. Um, I know a lot of the time the mental health issues are still there with individuals, you know, just dealing with that COVID and after COVID experience, uh, a lot of the stress, job changes, things like that too. So um, it's preferred if, if you guys do witness this, instead of confronting that individual, just call in the park rangers or someone else to address this. Um, Cause I know sometimes that can put you in a tricky situation. Um, but I do appreciate the other info as well um, from Kevin, uh, letting me know that uh there's the um Colorado has the highest auto theft uh, rates right now as well as the etching kits in district five uh, that may be something i reach out to my maintenance team on because i know we've had a few break-ins along the havana and smith road shop as well um so maybe we can uh work together on that and see if we can get those uh etched out there to prevent any extra thefts that are occurring i don't have too much else to fill in on um if there's any other questions you know i'm I uh, can also send out my information here. Um, but for right now, is there any other questions that I can answer? Yeah, Mike, just a couple uh, from me. Sure. What are the things that uh, you're best able to help uh, residents with when they call your number? What are, what are the things that they should uh, they should think about you you as a resource for? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, like you know, like I said, it's the we're, we're generally first responders for dogs being off leash for um, any violations that are occurring in the park if there's a structure or homeless encampment that has set up within the park boundary um, or a adjacent park um, adjacent right of way i guess that has an rv that's dumping um, things like that we can kind of assist with um, whether or not it's an rv that's on the edge of a park that may be something to where we have to contact another agency to address um, but we don't mind making first contact on those a lot of times to see if we can come to an agreement to be like hey we can't have dumping here this is also a residential area we need to um, pack up and move on kind of thing um, you know other than that it's uh, if you guys want to look up and familiarize yourself with uh, chapter 39 rules and regulations I could go on with numerous violations um, you know we do have park curfew so 11 p.m to 5 a.m is our curfew stuff so uh, if we do have anybody in the parks after hours that's something that we can address um, how often you get a call for illegal encampments within this area surprisingly quite a bit um so westerly creek i've had a lot of encampments throughout this last summer that's kind of been my pet peeve park um i've actually had uh i want to say about six to seven individuals that i've contacted throughout this last year um i know that's not a lot however all of these individuals that i'm referring to are considered undocumented um, they have come from argentina honduras somewhere else and they have nowhere else to go um, so no matter what kind of enforcement I do as far as a citation or anything else, um, that is something to where they're like, okay, you wrote me a citation. I have nowhere else to go. What do you want me to do? So in this case, that's when I refer to working with Officer Fair or uh, Colorado Coalition for the Homeless, or um, we have the Immigrants' Rights Coalition um, trying to set them up with a 
SB251 or an ITIN number, which is essentially a pen to where they can be identified within the state and start working, start building their life to get um, a job and to take a step in the right direction. Okay. Um, hi, Michael. This is Shalise, and I have another question. Can you tell me approximately how much it costs to clean up one of these illegal encampments? Um, that's a great question, and my answer is probably going to be it depends. <laughs> um, if we're referring to, I, I don't have actual stats on that right now um, with the larger encampments, such as the one that CDOT had to work with to where there's 29 tons of trash that's cleaned up. Um, when you consider the average adult elephant weighs six and a half to seven tons, um, that's a lot of trash that they had to clean up. So I know it's a um, multi-agency effort to try to get those cleaned up. If it's a structure here and there, um, you know, that's something that we usually pick up along our patrol and stuff, especially if there's violations and hazards within that. Um, but I can look into that and you, if you want to reach out via email, I can always uh, kind of pass that along uh, once I get those stats. Can you put your email in the chat, please? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I think he's got it there. I've got a question. Um, and actually, first a comment, Matt, Mike. Uh, we One of the questions we asked in our community survey was uh, what topics would people most want to hear about? And actually, Denver Parks and Rec was uh, one of the top responses. So I thought you'd be interested in hearing that, that uh, the community really likes to, to hear from Parks and Rec. Uh, my question, I don't know if you're the right person to ask this to or not, but you're probably familiar with the area I'm going to describe right now. It's near Akron Street and 25th Drive. There's an area where when there's a snow, like late, lately or, you know, winter, uh, all, excuse me, all of the water sort of pools on top of like half of the path and becomes like an icy mess. And do you know what the best approach would be for us to like work with the city to get some better drainage there so we're not getting a giant ice path there every winter? Yes, um, 25th and Akron. So that's going to be. Yeah, there's like a, a, you know, trash can right there and then a, a bench uh, in Greenway Park. Yes, I'm slightly familiar with that area. Um, as, as far as the ice patch and everything else goes, I would say if you want to reach out and um, send me an email on this, I can follow up with the proper um individuals i can always pass this along to liza who is uh, my supervisor director of the program um and then we could always reach out to um whether or not that's going to be wastewater or trying to get drainage i know a lot of our parks especially up in the northeast have been um, working on getting new irrigation this year um a lot more in the montbello area specifically uh has been replaced i know thomas park went under a complete rehaul of their irrigation as well this last summer um so seeing it over the summertime when they finish that to have uh vehicles parked in there for the pavilion use and everything else that's where it <laughs> extremely hurts when you see those vehicles right after the irrigation's fixed and uh that can cause more problems too. So, um, but yeah, if you want to reach out to me, I'll see if we can uh, work on trying to get that fixed uh, around the 25th and Akron area. Um, that way I'm not just trying to rely off a of memory on that. <laughs> yeah, that sounds great. I'll, I'll send you an email. I appreciate it. And is there a number that people should call? Cause you said something about calling. I wasn't sure if it's just normal 311 or if you can put your number in the chat, if there's a different number that you call. Um, yeah, I can leave my number in the chat. Um, however, I do want to refer everyone to reach out to 311 first. Um, if that's the best route to go, that's fine. I mean, I don't want you to get inundated because we will put this on the internet. So I don't want you to share your number too broadly. Internet, you said? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. And uh, yeah, so reach we'll out with email. Um, we'll, we'll go that route. If you want to reach out on the email, okay. and then I can always reach out. And if we need to have a conversation about it, then I can give you my phone number and we can go from there. So great. Appreciate it. Any other uh, questions for Mike? If not, Mike, thank you very much. I really appreciate you joining us. And Jack, thank you again for, uh, for facilitating. Absolutely. Um, Thanks for having me. Perfect timing. Yeah. Well, we'll move on to public comment and see if uh, anyone has anything they would like to say. Going once and twice. All right. Well, that will conclude our um, outreach hour. Uh, how does the board feel? Are, are, is everyone okay with just rolling straight into the um, to the board hour? Do people need a minute? 
I can't tell. Why don't we just roll straight into the board there then? Oh, sorry, Sandra says two minutes. Okay, we have everybody uh, two minutes. Um, again, our, our board meeting is public. You are welcome to stay and we will uh, regroup in, in two minutes. Bye, thank you. Bye, Sarah. Oh, I can st Mike is still on the call. I was going to just ask a question if he's still there and available for questions. I'll just see if he responds. Yay! There you go. Yeah, I, I felt like my questions were a little off topic, so I didn't want to ask during the, the proper um, Q&A time to make the meeting run long. Um, but I was wondering if you had any updates on the um, the implementation of the of the planned and funded playground renovation at um, Central, like the actual Central Parks playground? Um, so I don't, okay. um, there's there's a lot of transitioning that's going on right now. <laughs> um, we have a lot of supervisor changes to districts and things like that. Um, I may actually be moving out of the Northeast district here shortly. Um, I know there's been discussion of just a lot of flipping and popping uh, for people. But I know with Civic Center shutting down, um, we've got new Rangers on board. We're going to do 24 hour uh, coverage for Rangers. So we'll have more of a night ops team, um, things like that. Um, but as far as the playground goes, uh, that's going to be something that I'd probably have to talk to Dan Rockney on um, and discuss uh, when that's going to happen. I know there's um, plans of Verbena's basketball court moving further north. I know that's a little bit further south than Central Park though too. <laughs> I just okay. don't know the actual time frame of when these are, are playing out. Okay, thanks. And then um, the, my last question is just about the land around Northfield High School or the Sandoval campus. Um, uh, do you know where that is? Yeah. Okay, um, so just south of that, there's land that's owned by DPS, um, and so is, is, I guess if when there are issues with that land, 311 is the number for people to call in general, but do you have to respond to, it's like undeveloped land that's slated for park space, but do you get many calls for that area? Um, I will. I think I've only had a few select calls for that area, more on ATVs driving through there. Mm -hmm. um, it's rare right now because I believe most of the ATV calls that I'm getting is going to be Montbello into the GVR area. Um, with that being said, um, yes, we still will respond out there. Generally, when it kind of looks like a park, acts like a park, um, we get service calls on any um, land that kind of resembles it. So um, I've been called out to 71st in Yampa. It's owned by the city and county of Denver, though it is not a park land. So jurisdiction wise, I don't have any enforcement capabilities, um, but that is something to where I'll pass it on to the proper um, agency and they will address it. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, no problem. When we uh, get started with our uh, community, uh, excuse me, committee rates, um, I'll go first on behalf of uh, outreach. Um, we're continuing, one project we continue to work on is our welcome bags for, for new residents. Um, uh, Jeff Ederer in his new uh, capacity as the president of the Central Park Business Association. Uh, and I have been talking a little bit about that because that's a project that's historically been managed by that organization. Um, so he and I are working together on a, on a proposal where in both organizations potentially have uh, a role to play. And I'm going to present that to uh, CPBA in, is it, I think I got moved to April. Is that right, Jeff? Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, in the meantime, we do have uh, uh, the bags to, to produce. Uh, I was unable to attend the um, outreach committee meeting this week. Uh, Mark or, or Mandel, was there any other update on that topic specifically? Yeah, the update was specifically that I was waiting for new pricing. Okay. So 
um, I reached out to my brother-in-law who has a printing company and he actually sourced the bag, which I actually have a sample of here. Oh, great. Um, this is what we've been looking at, um, which is a very high quality bag. And so originally we were going to try and source them direct from manufacturing in China, but the pricing for shipping was extraordinary. Um, yeah. So we probably just need to get together and uh, like really rethink what we want to spend around the bag because even with the difference in the shipping, the manufacturing piece on this side of things is a little bit more. So it's kind of balancing out to sure. similar pricing. Um, he's all, he's also going to give me an option of a less expensive bag. So we can kind of take a look at that and see if that's something we want to move towards, or if we want to simply try and, you know, figure out if we can get these nicer bags funded in a way that makes sense. Okay. Um, when you have that uh, alternative pricing handle, can you send out like a table or something and you know, we can use that as a starter for a conversation? Yeah, absolutely. Cool. I think um, our goal is, is to be using them this spring um, in anticipation of there being uh, more, more public events in which we can participate. So uh, it's not pressing, but we are going to come up on, you know, April, May in no time here. So. I, let's, I'd like for that to be our, our goal. Thanks, man. I really appreciate your diligence there. I know it's a, it's a, it's a task. Um, for, uh, Mark, was there anything else in that meeting that you want to mention? I'm drawing a blank, so hopefully not. Okay. Oh, uh, here, yeah, I'll, I'll give one update on it, one idea, which is uh, will come as a surprise to do one, no one, then I'm the one bringing this up. Uh, one of the ideas for fundraising is potentially to do a CPUN Chipotle night. Um, I just did one with my kid's school, and it was quite successful. And I know Central uh, Sun did one back in the day, and uh, I was thinking about reviving it, especially now that you can do them twice a year. And uh, I can personally take care of two thirds of the minimum spend that we need to do. So uh, I wanted to see if anybody had a uh, uh, a, uh, any particular dates or anything in mind or any objections to it, or if I should just pick a date and then let you all know when I'm going to Chipotle. Jeez. I, I don't have any preference. Everyone I talking think to mic, muted mics. Well, this is Shalise and I know this is the board meeting. I'm not on the board, but I think Wednesdays are always a good day. Okay, Wednesdays, Chalice says Wednesdays a good to do you. Sounds good to me. All right, it's midweek. You know, it's like hump day, yeah. everybody's tired. <laughs> yeah, like you, your meal planning is falling apart for the week, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, my meal planning involves Chipotle pretty much every day. So, but yeah, sounds <laughs> okay. good. I, they, should, they should erect a plaque or something for you in that, at that location, Neymar. Um, let's see, uh, the DEI, uh, committee, any updates? Um, we do not have any committee updates at this time. We had some issues surrounding our <clears throat> survey data and not being able to open the attachments, but I was able to get that figured out and, and um, so now we're just waiting on the data to be reviewed. Okay. Did I, do I understand correctly, Amanda, that you were helping with that? Is that right? <clears throat> That's right. I, and I, I have the data now. And so Great. I will, I'll do my best to follow Mark's lead on an excellent presentation in the near future. <laughs> the, would the DEI committee like to do a similar, I assume so, uh, presentation for next month as what yes. Mark did for the general survey? Yes. And we'll, we'll present it at the, um, well, um, we'll, we'll review it over at the, at the CPA meeting, and then we'll also uh, present the information during the DEI committee meeting. Great, terrific. I'm looking forward to seeing that. Any other um, updates? I'll plan on uh, that in our agenda for next week. Uh, well, is this where I would mention, um, I know before we discussed uh, the DEI committee coming up with a speaker. Um, oh so, yeah. Okay, so um, Jamie Wright, 
uh, with the Metro Denver Homeless Initiative. Um, so I haven't reached out to her and asked her if this was something that she would be interested in. Um, but that's who we're thinking. Okay. We have March accounted for, um, Shalise. Do you think April would be a possibility? I think so. Okay. Um, I'll, before the end of the meeting, I'll get you the exact date just so that it's um, easier to make that ask. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. I really appreciate you doing that. Um, okay. Anything else? Uh, education? Very quickly, um, Amanda has something to say, but I just wanted to update around the website that the Foundation for Sustainable Urban Communities is putting together. Brian Weber is leading that. And um, I checked with him and he is saying now mid-March for that. So I just wanted to let you all know that and I'll be talking to him soon. Great, thanks, Carol. Um, the, um the piece that I want to add on education is just that last week Denver Public Schools held a meeting where they announced um, three options for how the um, Healthy Start Time uh, resolution that they adopted recently will be implemented and they're currently collecting feedback on those uh, and holding more public meetings. There's a public meeting happening right now or maybe it just ended. Um, but they have a survey up on their website. Um, so I'll look, put the link to the healthy start times in the chat. And um, I, I have not taken the survey yet. Um, but it's uh, from what I can see, it has options for giving feedback on specific attributes of the plans. But um, under one of the options, all bus service to schools and Central Park at the elementary and middle school level will be eliminated. Um, and some will be eliminated under a second of the three options. So, and then on, on the third option, um, some elementary schools will start you know, at like seven something, 7.30, 7.40 in the morning. So um, uh, a lot of big changes were announced right at the tail end of the choice period with uh, no real question, no real answers um, available, but they are in the process co of collecting feedback. And as a committee, we will um, do our best to gauge where we can find consensus on making a statement with DPS and perhaps working with them to facilitate discussion with uh, the leadership of uh, the, the schools in, in the region and um, getting community feedback here if um, our neighborhood is sort of impacted in one uh, major way, um, you know, as a whole, if all of the buses are cut. But anyway, so we'll, we'll be talking about that. I was um, just, and can you clarify how they want to receive that, that feedback? How they, uh, the, the survey seems to be how they want to receive it. This, okay. And the survey that's open now on that website. Okay. Um, my, and, and at their and public you, meetings. Yeah. There's one left. Okay. Um, you, tell me if I'm wrong, um, but in reading through the options, I can't help but feel like this isn't a healthy start issue so much as it is a busing issue and healthy, a start healthy start might be a mask yeah a healthy start might be a way to frame it as a, or frame a, a potential advantage of of a busing issue is that is that a correct interpretation in your i mean no one's using opinion? those words but i mean i don't understand how you could see anything but that when looking at these plans yeah it might be kind of like a, a, a side thing that they're slipping in. But I do know when I was a member of the Colorado Sleep Society that there are a number of sleep um, professionals who were really big on advocating this because there is a trend in adolescents to have a sleep shifting um, where they go to bed later and are waking up later and they are showing that how it affects their ability to function in schools. So that was the initial push for this healthy start time. The buses may have jumped on the bandwagon as an excuse, but that's kind of where it started. Mm. Yeah, I've heard that. I've heard that research as well um, in other contexts. Um, Sandra, I, 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 I just 
the, the proposals make me wonder which was which is the tail and which is the dog, I guess is what I'm saying. Or even just that if why did we jump into doing the healthy start time um, shift now when we don't have a, a way to kind of implement it mm -hmm. in a way that's palatable to the community? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think and I, and I think just finding help, helping people to to understand that um, that that aspect of the issue um, that there is a legitimate uh, budget issue here or resource issue here would it help people do uh, would inform how people maybe respond to some of these survey questions and so I worry that um, if they're not if if um, they're phrasing it as a healthy start issue that people's responses will be skewed accordingly. So, no, so it's very clear that this survey is like here is option A for um, okay. implementing it and schools could start as early as this that doesn't work well for my family like how well does that work for your family. Okay. Um, discovery link would be cut how does that work for your family. Um, okay. No, no bus service period how does that work for your family so it, those are the details um, for okay. which people That's can it. provide feedback but um, as a whole, um, all of the options are a little bit painful. Okay. I was going to say as the, I just want to chime in as the parent of a middle schooler who starts at 730 in the morning, it is killing us, it kills us. And the thought of it going, moving from our, our middle school child getting a later time, but then our elementary school child gets the same time, it feels like we're not actually solving for the problems that that exist. Um, so yeah, yeah I, I feel like the answer, they're, they're going to get a bunch of feedback on that survey that just says this will be difficult for my family, kind of no matter which option um, you're, you're kind of responding to. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Amanda and Carol, thank you for um, organizing uh, a community uh, response of sorts, uh, for lack of a better way of putting it. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, let us know if we can, as a board can help. Jamie, were you about to say something a second ago? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, no, I think actually Jeff kind of answered it. My main question was, is this because there aren't enough buses? Is this because there aren't, isn't enough funding for buses? We don't have enough bus drivers. Like what is the, what's the driving? The bus drivers. The bus driver. There's a like, huge short. Yeah, it's a, some of this. I think the Chalkbeat article that Amanda had sent, sent around said something like 30 some percent of their bus driver positions they can't fill. Um, so part of it is is yeah. I mean it, it's aligning bell times combined with moving the middle school and high school later. They they can't you know they ha they have to essentially have bus driver cycle through, which limits the number of bus driver routes, and that and the fact they just can't fill them all. So apparently they need a um, bus driver school as part of one of the options for high school or uh, uh, an apprenticeship program as part of one of your senior year things at some schools. Maybe that would be a good option. I don't know. They, um, some of the Aurora public schools, they're actually going to be building a site. So my organization is working with them a little bit on it, but they're building like an apprenticeship program for bus drivers and like transportation mechanics and all that kind of stuff. It's, you know, it's that bad that that's starting up like that. That's a good thing uh, to be training people for jobs. Yeah. Why don't we keep uh, moving uh, on to health and safety? Yeah, so we're going to, I'm sure, talk about this a little bit later. I think it had its own agenda item on our unhoused uh, action coalition. Uh, we'll follow up and, and discuss some of the things there. The other item that we will be uh, looking at is related to fire safety, fire prevention. I have been in touch with our uh, good friends at the Denver Fire Department, and we are working on uh, planning some presentations. Uh, maybe not the March board meeting, maybe the April board meeting. Uh, we, we might be able to have them uh, be able to present on some of the fire, fire mitigation uh, work that they're doing here in the neighborhood, uh, Central Park specifically, and the citywide. Uh, also an interesting statistic, there have been two wildland grass fires in the uh, northeast portion of the city, one in the Lowry area, the other in the Montbello area. So that is uh, an item that uh, they are acutely aware of and uh, they're actually doing a whole lot of work in the area and they are very excited to come speak with us. We just uh, got to find a time for, for them to uh, come, come uh, present. 
Thanks, Jack. Um, safe streets. Yeah, um, we had a great February meeting uh, where we had a representative from um, Dottie, Department of Transportation Infrastructure, come to talk about the 20 is plenty ordinance that passed a couple months ago. Um, and uh, unfortunately, due to a technical snafu, we weren't able to record it. Um, but uh, we do have the slides from the presentation. So if anybody wants to see those or help distribute them, um, I have those. Um, and then um, we're really excited for our March meeting um, where we're gonna have another person from um, Dottie uh, talk about the new complete streets um, guidelines they're releasing, which basically governs how they design streets around safety um, going forward. And unfortunately, it only applies to new, newly constructed streets that are going forward. Um, but it actually, um, this might be exciting for some on the call, um, includes a, a sort of a tentative step in the direction of using speed humps um, and other things to start mitigating speeding on streets. So um, if you're interested, we'd love to have you uh, March 1st at uh, 3 p.m. And then of course, uh, the bike lane, um, I'll give a quick update there. Um, you've probably seen the striping go down on Central Park Boulevard, very exciting. Um, we're also working with Dottie on um, doing a celebration event, uh, which uh, you can see my email this afternoon. Um, we're gonna try and shoot for April 9th, which is a Saturday. Um, to make sure that um, folks uh, don't miss it while they're on spring break. Um, so hopefully the tentative plan is to go from um, uh, Bill Roberts uh, school up to the Greenway and utilize the new protected bike lane on Central Park Boulevard. Um, and I think we're also gonna try and have some um, safe bike riding lessons and activities for kids as part of it too, um, and do some gift uh, giveaways with swag as well. So it should be fun. Great, thanks Brad. I'm excited about that one too. Uh, do you want to talk about sustainability while you're on the mic? Um, yeah, so next Wednesday, um, in partnership with the city, we're going to be doing a fruit tree harvest roundtable, um, which should be really exciting. Um, and then uh, next month's meeting, I'm really excited about um, to help organize this. We're going to have someone from a group called um, Rewiring America about sort of the benefits um, and how to start to you know electrify your house. Um, so replacing appliances that use natural gas. So things like your HVAC, your oven, um, your hot water, um, your hot water heater. Um, you know some people their dryers are gas powered, but how to replace those with going electric um, and the benefits without sacrificing performance of doing so. So really excited about that one as well. <coughs> Mark, were you going to add something? No, I just had a frog. Ah, just a reminder for the, that fruit tree harvest, that's what the city did take the project that the sustainability committee did this past fall um, citywide, likely starting with the other neighborhoods that participate in the sustainable neighborhoods program. So it'd be a really exciting uh, and cool um, accomplishment for this group to, to have something like that go citywide. Be, uh, I'm really looking forward to that as well. Thanks everybody, there's a lot going on. It's really great. Um, I wanna provide a couple of quick follow-up items on the next slide there, Mark. The first is now that we have um, Aurora residents in the, uh, in the, under the steep umbrella, we talked about having a representation from uh, Aurora Police Department and our outreach meetings. I've been in touch with, thanks to Lieutenant Hines, um, Aurora Police Department, and I have, I believe the correct officer, but I haven't been able to quite um, pin down time for a conversation with them, um, but looking forward to doing that in the coming weeks, and hopefully we'll uh, have them here uh, next month. That's my goal. Um, the other thing I want to update you on was um, Brian uh, and I joined a conversation between uh, SDC, Park Creek Metropolitan District, Westerly Creek Metropolitan District, and a few other community stakeholders to sort out the kind of last issues that are preventing this financing, uh, refinancing thing from being resolved. And it's actually pretty simple. Um, the Westerly Creek Metropolitan District wants a seat on the Park Creek Board um, and, and 
Brian, you can weigh in on this as well if, if you think uh, you want to add anything. Um, but what they also want is assurances that whoever is elected to fill that seat will be approved by SDC. SDC assigns several seats, I think three of the five seats to the Park Creek Board. Uh, and the, uh, and the um, SDC just wants assurances from the city that they aren't going to be held responsible should the person that's, that um, is elected doesn't, uh, you know, uh, if they if that person were to upset the apple cart in any kind of way was the was the uh, was the tone um, or the implication I, as I took it of of what SDC was concerned with. I think it really was just legal due diligence on their part. But as soon as as soon as um, SDC can uh, get um, sign off from the city that they won't be held responsible for anything if if they just approve a a publicly elected um representative from westerly creek onto that board then then they should be fine so we're trying to schedule when the next meeting will be the the takeaway from that call was basically that um the lawyers needed to go talk about that specific issue and then we were all going to reconvene and um another i think next week is when we're trying to do it um, and then figure out where they, where they are. But, but as far as a sort of public process where CPON needs to take a, uh, have, a, have a vocal position or anything like that, that's really not uh, the situation. It's more just to be open and, and public about what's being debated at this point. Brian, would you characterize that any differently? No, Jeff, the only thing that I was a little surprised about was, um, the election has basically already happened. They just haven't seated the two um, Central Park residents. So that is my understanding. It isn't like there are open positions and there will be election. There were there were open positions. There were only two people that expressed yeah. interest in positions, and thus there was no election. So um, you know that that's just so everybody knows. There's not going to be this big election coming up for these seats. That election has already happened. Um, SDC is just trying, and I think you know, in in due respect to um, to Tammy, um, you know the the fact that uh, you know the death of their chairman happened. Um, it's it's kind of threw her a little bit of a loop. So they're trying to work through it and get everything taken care of um, since um, Pat had passed away. And for their part, Brookfield has no issues. Um, the other, uh, anyone affiliated with Park Creek Metropolitan District doesn't have any issues. It's it's squarely with SDC to figure out if they have any legal considerations before signing off on that one clause. Uh, when they do, um, this whole issue is resolved. So who are the two candidates that were the only two candidates? Uh, they weren't named Brian in that meeting. I'm, I'd have to I'd have to go look that up. So uh, Jeff, it was a uh, it was myself and Andrew Bartlett. Yeah. Oh, it yeah. was. Yeah. Oh. No, I knew. I knew. Oh, congratulations on. Yeah. <laughs> I knew Shalise was one of them, but I didn't know um, who the other one was. Yeah. And who, who's Andrew Bartlett? Um, Is... Andrew's been a long term, a long time. He was he was part of the. Um, was he not part of? Um, He's the East uh, Bridge uh, District Delegate. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Shalise, as the as a presumptive uh, board member, would you add anything to what I said about where this stands? No, that's that's the hold up. <laughs> that's basically it. Okay. <laughs> that's exactly. What it so Shalise, Shalise, are there any other neighborhood groups you're not a part of? You seem to be leading oh, everywhere. Oh, not a part of. Um, uh, no, I can't think of any off the top of my head. <laughs> <laughs> well, well done, then. Yeah, Shalise, thank you for all you do. Um, that's a lot. Thank you. <laughs> You're all welcome. <laughs> all right. If we want to go on to the next slide. Okay. Citizens Advisory Board. So um, a couple of weeks ago, I was approached by... Uh, a couple of members of CAB uh, about the possibility of CPUN taking over 
the remaining responsibilities that that organization has historically been responsible for. Um, if you're uh, not familiar with CAB, they, um, they basically uh, are charged with um, ensuring that development on the old airport property uh, aligns with the Green Book principles. And they make recommendations on development proposals to the SDC. Um, and so with the um, build out of Central Park more or less complete, the number I was given was 97%. Um, they, that organization is having a hard time justifying meetings and its continued existence, but they wanna see the project through. They wanna make sure that um, things like the affordable housing uh, came up repeatedly, just to make sure that that um, gets to the promise threshold, uh, making sure that um, the Green Book principles um, are alive and well, it should, they, should they disband. Um, they do have one non-voting seat on the SDC board, which um, in theory, CPON would would assume as well. Um, but I think the question for this group is, is whether A, that's um, appropriate for this organization to take on, um, whether there is the capacity uh, to take it on. What I told um, uh, Jim and Lucia was that uh, I would certainly bring it back to the board for a discussion um, and, and they were satisfied with us just considering it for the time being. Um, and, and figuring out under what circumstances we want to uh, or, or not uh, take on this responsibility. Um, uh, can, I, can I answer any questions about CAB or anything like that before uh, opening the floor to, to thoughts? Well, just how many um, subcommittees do they currently have that are active? They're, they're, they're down to a very small group of people who who are active at all. I don't think subcommittees are even a factor. That's one of the reasons why they're, they want to disband is they're uncomfortable with the idea that such a small number of active members of their organization are, are making, making decisions. You know, We're talking less than five people that, that participate regularly. They're having a hard time organizing even quarterly meetings, that kind of thing. Do we Any know other uh, questions about it? Yeah, hey, Jeff. Do we, SD, do we know what the SDC thinks about this idea? Um, no, I have not talked with uh, Tammy about it, but it's a great question, um, Jeff, and it's one of the, the follow-up calls that, that would be made if, if the board is interested in pursuing it. Okay. So that's one of the core functions, right? I mean, you have that as the bullet point that it serves as an advisory role to the SDC, but do that, does CAB also sort of write a report to the mayor's office about um, like sort of critiquing the role of, of SDC? They do, well, they have. They also haven't done one in about three years. And, and as Jim said, uh, no one's asked about where it is. Um, so, so, so um, he, the way it was described to me was that they would like to see something like that resurrected, but uh, it would be more memo-like than, than report-like in, in their estimation. I, I know that uh, the, uh, we pointed uh, the uh, Cab had reached out to the MC about uh, um, perhaps us um, assuming some of that. We I, we pointed them towards CPUN. We thought this would be the more appropriate uh, location for for that to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, so to take that hat off for a second uh, and go back to uh, my my CPUN hat, I think this is a great. I mean, it would it would add to the list of things we do, but I don't think it would add substantially to the list of things that we do. Um, and I also think that, especially as we finish development and move, you know, into we have a developed community, now we need to sustain the community. I think that is a good, that's something we're already doing here at CPUN, and to just consolidate the organizations would probably uh, prove to be more effective and more efficient. Yeah, I would agree with that to say that. It 
Um, I also think that uh, this would be really beneficial for our organization from the standpoint of like having a role that somewhat matters in the process. Like I, I think as part of this process, their the development plans would be required to go to us. They can still ignore them, uh, any comments we have, but at the very least we would be able to um, bring in a lot more public input to the process, I believe, or at least public awareness of any final decisions than we would be able to if we weren't in a, you know, semi-formal role like this. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, this is something that was discussed many times before. And my biggest concern was, well, our mission doesn't necessarily align with uh, development proposals that are consistent with the Green Book. But at this point, with most of the development done, I think most of those decisions have been made. And this is mostly going to benefit us and, you know, being able to voice the you know views and desires of the community in a you know proactive way i think that would be helpful and i'll also note that we have broken ground on the final single family residential parcels so they're they're under construction um they we anticipate them being done uh, at the end of this year or the beginning of next uh the only parcels that remain are commercial or um, transit oriented development. There, there is not any single family residential parcel that is still yet to be developed. Um, that, that construction's already underway way up north uh, where it's practically uh, Wyoming. Um, but uh, that was a joke. Nobody laughs at my jokes. <laughs> um, We're all on mute, we all laughed. Uh, but there is, you know, there, there's not a lot more, it's, it's mostly commercial development that we're still looking at, um, or the transit oriented development would be the, the last residential development that we look at that hasn't been started yet. And even then that, that development is also underway. Uh, it's progressing very slowly, but it is underway. This board's always shied away from weighing in on development issues um, or zoning issues. But this strikes me as different in a couple of key ways. One is that we're not talking about the re-redevelopment. We're talking about the original parcels of um, what was the airport property. Um, we also are tasked with um, uh, referencing the Green Book as sort of a neutral source in terms of it does it does it align with or does it not and and um, that's the domain that we'd be operating in specifically. So I feel like if we wanted to take this on, we could do so without being in conflict with um, the stance that we've taken as a board on other development related issues. Does well, that and, hold water for, for people? Jeff, the, the historic content or the historic context is um, that the reason why we've stayed away from it is because CAB um, was taking that role during the development. But I think it's a it's a time where that transition begins, and we, like all other RNOs, need to probably step up to that. And I think that's so. So I'm agreeing with what you're saying. I'm just saying historically, the reason why we've shied away from it is because we had the CAB. Cab was there, and so yeah. I don't see that there's any conflict there, other than we were doing it out of courtesy to the cab. Um, uh, I was just going to add my two cents. I've attended a fair amount of cab meetings um, over the past, like say, two years or so. Um, and you know, on the one hand, like it's definitely you know there's a little bit of a technical aspect to it, but not enough. I don't think we could weigh in on things. Um, I think one of the pros might be is mo the makeup of the cab had a lot of people who didn't, um, even though they're sort of the, the, the Central Park slash Stapleton OGs, so to speak, that have been around for a long time and been involved with it, uh, a fair amount of people on that you know, board did not actually live in the neighborhood mm -hmm. um, and may not have had the same sort of skin in the game as all of us who live here. Um, and, and I think um, often times, and I know and respect a lot of people on that board, um, maybe sometimes papered over things that we'd be a little bit more concerned about in terms of livability, including like traffic impacts and mobility and non-car ways to access commercial development and stuff. So um, I, I would be supportive of playing some role. I also appreciate that it, it's a, an opportunity to talk to developers before um, things really get going rather than sort of on the back end um, when things are largely set in stone. And if there is a conflict or issue, it's tougher to resolve. 
Um, so th those are my two cents. Well, I want to add, so just speaking of that opportunity, I was pretty active in going to the zoning and planning meetings, and I don't really feel like I ever had that opportunity. Like it felt like things were pretty far along by the time they came to that point. And so I don't know if there's some other meeting earlier in the pipeline where there really is that opportunity for engagement and like community input on on all of those attributes that Brad just listed. Um, but it, uh, the way that those are structured now, it's it's a bit of a here's my plan. And then when feedback is given, they're like, well, that's not what we were planning to do. And then it's like, well, this is what we're asking you to do. And then they maybe agree to circle back. Um, so yes, there it is an opportunity to, to provide some feedback, but um, things are a little bit farther along than um, one would hope in coming to a community to get input. You know, Amanda, my interest there are isn't those, so much of that. Go ahead, Jack. I was just going to say there are other meetings that uh, that those things are discussed in. I just don't think they invite any of us to them. They, but like when Brookfield sells a parcel of land, there are those meetings. Just they're the only ones invited. Right. Yeah, they're not public. Yeah. Yeah, and and yeah. I don't have any expectation that they're going to uh, accept our opinions on anything. Um, I was looking at it more of the view that it's an opportunity to get access to some of these documents and share them with the community before, uh, shall we say, land is, you know, or the, the, the openings of the buildings have happened or something like that. Um, you know, and like, like the zoning and planning meetings, I don't even, I mean, the ZAP meetings, I don't know, did you ever get like PDFs that you could post online or was it all the first time you got to see it was at the meeting and then they decided and it was over? Oh, for sure. Yeah, the first time was definitely at the meeting, but um, we could like I could take a picture with my phone of like the hard copy that they brought to the front of the room, that sort of thing. Um, and then I would I would share that. I mean, this is this all start. I, my attendance at these meetings started with the, the gas station in, in Eastbridge um, being slated yeah. to go in across from the affordable, the um, income qualified housing. Um, yeah, and so that you know that did result in in a modification to the plan. So I shouldn't I shouldn't give the impression that nothing ever changes. But um, anyway, yeah, yeah and, but no, I, nothing I think is we'll circulated get PDFs in advance. That we can share more easily. So yeah, okay. I think we can ask for those. Like uh, maybe I, not to be mean, but the uh, the the SDC folks are kind of old timey in their ways and still like those paper copies. I mean, I go to meetings with them all the time where they hand me the big old thing. I have a stack of them rolled up under my desk. Uh, so I'm sure if we, that's because that's how they want them delivered. I'm sure we can ask for them in PDFs. Uh, can, can Amanda sneak into your office with her phone and take some pictures? And, no, uh, I'll just give them to Amanda. I don't want them. She can ask. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I think I think it would be helpful for us from the standpoint of our, give people what reading our emails to be able to send them to, you know, whatever the latest plans are for the park here or the park there or the whatever retail there, just so they know so that they're aware um, and, you know, be a little bit more relevant from that standpoint. Yeah, and I guess maybe there there's the 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 hope that perhaps um, if we were at the helm of that communication with all of those entities, then perhaps communication would be better because we we do rely on different modes, kind of like what, what Jack was saying. Um, and so yeah. maybe just with us in the role, it it could be better. Um, I'm not hearing any major concerns. Does anyone want to speak up? Speak up against doing this. Well, if nobody else is going to, I'll say the workload might be a little bit cumbersome, but I think it'll be worth it. So would I'll we roll those sides. meetings into our meetings or would we need to still host that same number of meetings that they're currently hosting? That's a good question. And kind of where I wanted to go next was what questions can I get answered? Um, I think Jeff's question about what does SDC have to say about this is a good one. That's a good one, Amanda. Um, are there others? And, and maybe just email me uh any questions that you might add to the list i could start a doc something like that with the idea being that i can go back to um cap and say we're, we're, we are interested in it let's talk through these issues and then maybe at the next board meeting we can vote we can sort of get uh, i can share out that information and we can vote officially on whether to, to proceed or not does that sound reasonable and and yeah. jeff i would just i would just ask 
Tammy, when you're talking to her, what staff support we would still get as yeah. the process, because I think that's the biggest, the, you know, SDC staff has been doing a lot over the years. I don't know how much they continue to do, mm -hmm. um, but would there be continued SDC staff support if yeah. um, through any of those, excuse me, development processes? And I know SDC staff is is very much bare bones. Like uh, there, there are two staff members. It's Tammy and Jan. Uh, Jan's their accountant and Tammy's the, the president there. So, I mean, I, I don't know if we should hold our breath for much staff support because they're they're pretty whittled down. No, I and and I know that Jeff, Jack. I just want to make sure that we don't have any expectations, and that I think that's part of the reason why the cab hasn't done as much is because SDC staff hasn't done it, and so we as a board need to realize if we're going to make it work, we're going to have to staff it, and and I think that's the bigger, you know, the bigger issue. Yeah. And that's probably worth digging in just as a general topic, um, Brian, worth digging into more. Okay, so what I'll do is start a- I've got one, one, Oh, I'm sorry, Amanda. Sorry. A question, no worries. Um, what happens to the, you said there's a handful of people left in CAP. What happens to those people? What kind of role would they play if we were to take it over, if any? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. They would, um, the, the two that I spoke with, Jim and Lucia said, that they would essentially dissolve, but were uh, very interested in being advisors um, uh, and that we could call on them with questions and, and whatever support we might need. They were very eager to, to play that role. Okay. Yeah, I, I would, Jim is obviously an expert and, and an yeah. attorney that would be super helpful, especially as this gets off the ground if we end up doing it. I guess the other question I would have is, will we need another committee or will we be able to like put this into one of our existing committees like outreach and communications? Yeah, that's a good question too. Okay. We could have the CAB committee, one committee just focused on those things. Uh, and then they would have a committee meeting which would essentially replace the CAB meetings mm -hmm. and that would solve our question of additional meetings. Yeah, I'll ask you about that. Yeah, I think I think we should. I think uh, sorry, Liz. I think we should we should try to incorporate this into our structure. Wouldn't require a bylaw change to set up a new committee, but I think the more that we can just do the structure, we, it would be better. And sorry, Liz, go ahead. Yeah, no, I mean, I I agree. Seeing how to fold fold it into what already exists. Um, one committee of the CAB that I was familiar with was the Housing and Diversity Committee. Um, and I know that at least as of a couple of years ago, they were um, kind of one of the Green Book um, uh, goals, I think that they were kind of monitoring was the reaching the affordable housing goals. Um, and I think that they were, they, they felt pretty good about where we were at on um, affordable home ownership options, but um, rental, like um, I think income restricted and affordable rental units was kind of the, the last piece, I think of that part of the green book they were concerned about. So I would just wanna make sure that whatever, you know, what, whatever they had been working on or whatever remaining concerns they had kind of around um, achieving that, you know, from the DEI perspective, I wanted to just make sure that we, kind of moved forward with that also and that it didn't kind of get lost in the transition. Yeah, uh, Liz, that was one of the re main reasons why Jim and Lucia reached out um, was making seeing issues like that through um, mm -hmm. to their, to their promised uh, conclusions. So that would that would be a priority. Great, thank you. Yeah. All right, we are going to run out of time here. Um, <laughs> Uh, can I can I uh, just organize these questions, circulate them, and then uh, maybe within a week or so, if you could add any additional ones, and then I'll try to talk with Tammy and then Jim and Lucia again. Uh, okay, survey discussion. Getting back to that, uh, Mark. Um, thank you for doing that pre presentation. Thank you for organizing the um, uh, the data in the first place. Um, as far as distributing it, um, it, one thought I had, Mark, was can we embed a 
link to a PDF file in our in our newsletter or something like that as one way to get the way out, get the sure. data out. Yeah, um, that's easy enough. Yeah. Uh, Plus I, there's I, the front porch part. There's the front porch as well and then social media. I don't think, Liz, you, you tell me, um, but I don't think you can upload documents to a Facebook post, right? It has to be photographs. Um, you can take a screenshot of the document. Um, and yeah. actually in, uh, I think actually there are some in Facebook groups you can do, um, you, you can upload PDFs, but it's not as accessible. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but yeah, usually I take a screenshot of something and, and post that as a photo, um, instead of like a PDF or a document. Yeah. You can save a PDF as a JPEG. And so then each yeah. sheet of it becomes a picture and then that can be uh, uploaded. Okay. Yeah. Um, in previous surveys, Amanda, you've always done a really nice job of providing kind of a summary of, of key findings. Um, and, and Mark, as far as the front porch goes, I wonder if, if that can be this also, if that makes sense, if we can write that yeah. in a way that, yeah. I, I can write something up. I just wasn't sure what how many of those 10 questions we or 10 slides we would want to include because i think all 10 would be too much um but i know we also have some you know content that we want to fill in and i wasn't sure if there's anything else that we want to try to in include or or cut um but i can put the, together something um tomorrow yeah no problem because brian weber emailed us saying we've got until the 18th so yeah, that's, right. that's, long, that's pretty late right. so you know i i'm i'm a uh uh a veteran of the uh, sunspot days when we had to, you know, write it the, the night before or something. So I know you're not, not yeah. that kind of person who does it the night before, Jeff, but I am. So <laughs> I was thinking about there's so much good data that trying to use the front porch to communicate all of it is it's just not feasible. So so maybe we take one image as just kind of a representative sample, but try to write something that's more broad and holistic and doesn't even necessarily explicitly address that um, whatever slide we choose to to include just i mean i'd probably pick that first one that shows all the different issues in the ratings and then kind of yeah. go about how this will you know weigh in on our our work over the next year or two and then we'll monitor some of these results and then also look at them uh in detail later so amanda's more of a uh, written memo person than i am i'm just i like to throw out a graphic and say figure it out yourself so Okay. Um, other thoughts on, on circulating this um, survey results? Yeah, I was actually just thinking about what Mark just said about, you know, throwing it out there and letting people figure it out themselves. I think if we have some sort of write up as to what we believe these um, results show and what we plan to do uh, accordingly, I think that would be helpful. And then other the other thing I was thinking is like if we do have something in the um, in the paper, I was thinking sunspot, but in 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 the article that we're doing in the paper, if we could point that to um, the more in depth um, what a documentation that we come up with, and maybe we'll put that on on our site. Mm -hmm. So that yeah, can go in and look at that. So yeah, that's what I wanted to mention. Yeah, that's a good idea. The website just using the website anymore. Yeah, I do think what you just said then, there, Mandel, about it being sort of incumbent upon us to take this data as committees and see if we see something in it that, as a committee, we want to act on as well, and so. Mark, maybe you could circulate that PDF to the board and every every committee can kind of take a look and see where there might be opportunities to to pro deeper. I, I don't wait. Uh for the thing that's due on the 18th though, that's like three days away. We don't oh, have to no, no, no. wait. No, that. Me. Oh. Yeah, no, no. I I meant longer term than that. Just um one of the reasons we do this survey is that CPUN can figure out where to spend its time, right? And so the, the, the committees can take a look at the data and see if there's connections to, you know, Denver Police Department, like, like Mark was suggesting that we want to start making on particular topics. 
so I think that's just a request of the of the board is that that people take a look at the the data and see if that's something that if they see anything in it that they want to act on. Amanda, in the past, is as how is the can you think of examples of where uh, survey data was used to spur a particular action by the board? Sorry to put you on the spot. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> let's see. Sorry. Oh, uh, I mean, we've definitely like we had a survey a couple of years ago where we like worked with people in advance and like had specific questions from them. Like the library asked about like uses for their. Um, I'm going to call it the do room, and that's not what it's called, but um, that the makerspace. Um, and so then mm -hmm. we specifically gave them back those specific answers. Um, Chris Herndon's office had asked about things that could happen on the, I think, police academy land if it had turned over. Um, and so we gave those back. I mean, so it was more like we we sort of gave people information back. Um, yeah. We, I don't know if there's anything. Um, well, Mark Shaker once gave us credit for uh, one of our surveys asking about what kind of retail people would want for Stanley Marketplace and the Stanley Bureau. He has said that. Yeah, yeah that is true. That's very kind of him. Not I seem to recall us using some of that survey data with DPS, Amanda, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We have. And that, I mean, there was the whole like community census that we did um, yeah. in 2009, um, which was a separate, um, it was a little bit separate from surveys in general. So, well, I, yeah. And the, the choice zone setup that we have is actually uh, was essentially we used the survey to demonstrate community, broad community support for it. And then yeah. DPS tried to put in their own plan, and then the community didn't speak kindly of that at their five public meetings. Yeah. Well, but your point's well taken, Amanda, that at the very least, sharing the information with the entities around the community that would care about that particular question is, is something we can easily do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and in the past, I think that Mark has sort of uh, mentioned like a threshold of something like 66%, which is like what our like community-wide voting would be. So like for something actionable, like there are two questions in the survey that Mark currently has that we didn't go over tonight. Um, just about like plans to attend Northfield and opinions about like boundary stuff with school that he's going to get back to the education committee. Um, and so those are areas where I think we as a committee um, will be better informed once we have the survey data. Um, and I also like to quote that people really like sidewalks here. Uh, sorry, okay, um, that's it, I'm done. That's based on survey data. It's like the number one amenity that everyone likes the most. That's because a lot of parts of the city do not have sidewalks in their neighborhoods. Right. <clears throat> well, uh, Mark, thank you for doing that again. And thanks for um, uh, the, the front porch draft. You and I can kind of go back and forth on that mm -hmm. in the next couple of days. Um, we are at time. Um, our, I'd like to talk about the UAC thing if we can. Um, are people willing to put in a few extra minutes here to allow well, that? Let me, let me just yeah. let me just say, um, I think that we need to table this, but um, for the next meeting. But what I do want to say is that uh, the day after the meeting, Travis contacted me and asked for feedback. And he took, we gave, I consulted with Liz and we gave him some feedback and we gave him some very specific things. Um, and a few days later, I happened to run into him. And he said, I took this to the committee. I've taken it to our lawyers. I think that what you said was very valuable and we'll be um, acting on that. So he's, his group, he and his group are very amenable to conversations and collaboration. Um, three committees expressed an interest in following up with this. Education was one of them um, and a DEI and health and safety. And all those committees have met and they've discussed the issue. Um, I was unable to be at the educational committee last one, so it didn't get brought up, but I'm going to inform the members of the committee, um, it, just give them an update and give them some background information. Um, so what I'd like to do is write this up for you and send it to the board. I'll be as concise as I can and bullet points and that sort of thing, just to update you as to uh, what has happened since our meeting, our January meeting. And it's been very interesting to me 
in the last um, couple of weeks since that meeting, there have been numerous articles that are um, very much integrated with this issue. Um, the, the city is giving more money for SOS. Uh, the STAR program is being expanded um, and is being funded um, with more dollars. And so they're just, and I will include links to those stories. Um, and, um, and I think also I sent this to some members um, the survey for, of the homeless began again. Um, and this is a national effort. Um, and there was a story in the Colorado Sun the end of January um, about exactly what was being asked. People were on the streets and consulting with people and finding out the needs and the numbers have increased mightily as we might expect. So I just want to, um, I know many, several people here are, um, had something to say about that because they're on those committees, the DEI and health and safety. But um, I think just, I don't wanna rush this. Um, I wanna give it the respect that it needs. And so I will write something up for you if that's okay with everybody. Yeah, please. And I feel the same. I don't wanna rush it either. Carolyn, thank you for, for doing that diligence and Liz as well, thank you. Um, yeah, I look forward to hearing um, what, what feedback Travis uh, is looking to adopt and, and, what, and I'll make sure that this is at the top of the um, agenda for next month, Carol. Uh, Thanks, Jeff, sorry. I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, sorry we weren't able to give it more time. Yeah, Brian, do you wanna do a quick treasurer's report? Not much to say other than we got the check from the foundation. So we're back up to $9,700 in our bank account. So we're in good shape. Great, yeah. Um, Brian Weber, uh, along with um, the check, sent a very uh, complimentary note of this group. Uh, he's very appreciative of our efforts towards the community. And I think their financial support is, uh, is a, a strong indicator of that. So. Um, thank you, everybody, for continuing to be a part of CFUN and for all that you're doing. This is, we, we never have enough time in these, in these calls for everything that everybody's doing. So uh, thank you for that. Um, I will circulate, uh, recirculate. Actually, I don't think I need to. I updated that same Google Doc today with a map, Liz, where I've sort of plotted where we have residents and, and have the full slate for um, everybody to take a look at as well. So if um, I think what we need to do relatively quickly, like in the next month is assemble a, um, a recruitment committee to manage the slate at the main meeting and start uh, evaluating potential new board members. Um, so I'll send around an email um, that uh, outlines that along with uh, the refresh doc. Hey, hey Jeff. Uh, I don't know why yeah. I didn't think this was before, but uh, a standard Sunspot article used to be, uh, we have board seats open, please apply yeah. when we have that oak coming up. So that should really be the highlight of our thing. I and mean, we can definitely have a- We should do that, yeah. Uh, yeah. That, but th th this should really be, be a highlight of like, if you wanna help work on these issues, please apply, you know, something like that. Yeah, perfect. Anything else? Sorry, we ran over. We always do, so that's okay. Thank you. Carol, can you stay on for like three minutes to talk after this? Sure. Okay, thanks. Thanks, everybody. Have a good evening. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night.